Buenos días. Good morning, everybody. Germán introduced me very kindly and said uh, many kind words about me, but what he didn't say is that I'm, I'm from Europe, I'm from Spain, I'm from Madrid. I've been in the U.S. for 30 years, yet I'm not from Miami, although my firm is located in Miami. Uh, I'm very surprised to be here. First of all, I want to thank uh, the, the Basque government, uh, Spain, Europe, as well as the EAEC for inviting me to speak. And uh, I'll be speaking, it's not tomorrow, it's Thursday, right? Okay, you, you, you scare me with that. On Thursday, I'm going to be chairing a panel uh, of uh, aerospace experts, aviation experts, where we are going to present to, to all of you the opportunities in the U.S. in the aerospace industry. And, and I was surprised to be invited because in some of these uh, economic development uh, forums, the aerospace industry is very seldom invited, uh, even though it accounts for almost 5% of the global domestic product. It's a $4 trillion industry a year, yet it's clouded by more known industries such as the automotive, uh, biomedical, construction, or, or simply the mainstream energies. But I'm very surprised that uh, Herman gives me uh, 20 minutes or 15 minutes today, for all those that are very hungry, to talk a little bit uh, about the detail of the aerospace industry, which is the energy aspect of aerospace which uh, is not huge, but it's not small either. We are talking about an industry that is probably a half a trillion US dollars, which is 500 billion, uh, uh, 500,000 million in, in Europe. So it's not insignificant, but it's very, very significant in the sense that the technologies that apply to the aerospace industry affect every other technology or every other energy development uh, we have. When we talk about wind turbines, if you can think of the development of a wind turbine comes from an aircraft turbine. So the technologies we are seeing in the space industry and in the aviation industry trickle down to the automobile industry, to the telecommunications, and to many other aspects that we live day by day about it. So you will have this presentation. I'm not going to go in detail about it. I just want to give you a few ideas, a few concepts of opportunities that exist in the U.S. And then I'd like to give you some pathways or some bridges of how to, for you European stakeholders, how to come to the U.S. and participate in these opportunities. For me, as, as a, a U.S. company, I'm very interested also in looking at how American companies involve in this type of opportunities. And not only companies, but universities, government agencies, can come to Europe and also play in Europe. And, and um, this decade is very, very important in the European-American relationships when it comes to the aerospace industry. And I'll tell you why. The, this is the first decade, uh, pretty much in history, where information technology, intellectual property, and computer cyber security plays a huge role in how the world operates. For the aerospace industry, uh, the safety and security of these technologies, the safety and security of this energy, is even more critical than from, uh, for any other sector. So why do I say this? Because the development of EU, e EU and US relationships when it comes to aerospace have never been better. And have never been better because Europe and the US are very much alike in the sense of evolved democratic systems, respect to human rights, and many of the other platforms that make aerospace safety a, a, a first consideration. So, in my view, this is the decade of EU-USA collaboration. And on Thursday, if you come, and I'd like to invite you to come and to bring some participants from, from aerospace, but also not from aerospace, because some of the things that the panelists will be saying and some of the things I'll be saying will affect all the other sectors with touch um, aerospace. I'll go through a, a quick case in point of what I'm talking about. This, this is... Uh, uh, an experiment that Boeing uh, performed in the European Union with a research laboratory, which is based in Spain, it's based in Madrid, yet incorporates most of the European Union countries. When we talk about energy, uh, in aer one of the first aerospace uh, um, new energies coming up is uh, electric, electric fuel cell, hydrogen power. I'm not a technologist, so I'll talk about energies in, in general, but I'd like to show you what happens 
when, when a new energy is explored between the US and Europe. So this aircraft you see flew in 2008 and became the first aircraft in the world to fly with a fuel cell engine with a human being on board. It was a, built by Boeing with European scientists in Madrid, and that flight took place in Ocaña, south of Madrid in the Toledo area. Now, after this flight, what happened is that half a dozen small and medium-sized businesses in Spain and in Europe got to develop further all of those elements that you see on the aircraft, the fuel cells, the control systems, the electronic management systems. So out of an experiment, there were businesses that grew, technologies that were sold back and forth between the US and Europe, and jobs created. So having said that, the rest of the presentation, if you can keep in mind how we can bridge any of the new energy developments between the US and, and the EU uh, to make a technology case, to make an academic case, but also to make a business case, to make money with it. A little bit what I was saying before, the, the, the US has a, an impending opportunity. It's a business opportunity, but it's also a technology opportunity. But it's a business opportunity. We are talking about the US per year spends in aerospace consumption of fuels and energy for aircraft and the infrastructure that support aircraft and now also spacecraft, uh, roughly $200 billion per year. So th this business uh, um, needs to reinvent itself. The US has clearly determined, the Department of Defense has determined that the, the, the economic problems that price volatility in the price of oil, especially the OPEC controlled oil, causes to not only the civilian but the military uh, uh, aerospace industry in the US needs to end. So in order to stabilize the prices, and it's important to know the price is not what matters, what matters is the volatility of it. So to stabilize it, the US has embarked in a public private and pl public-private partnership program where it invites companies and people from everywhere in the world that speaks the same language, politically speaking, and also socially speaking, and here's where the EU is number one favored partner, uh, to affect savings in the aerospace energy uh, consumption. So when we talk about aerospace, I'd like to, to point out that everybody knows aircraft, airlines fly with jet engines, jet fuel. And that, that's about $200 billion a year. However, there's a new industry being born in the US, and on Thursday we'll talk about uh, this industry a lot. That's why I'd like to invite you to come and listen, because what's being born today in the US in the aerospace industry is no different from what was born 20 years ago in the Silicon Valley in the IT industry. When the internet became uh, available, when the microprocessors came available, it revolutionized the way we see life today. Well, let me tell you, in the aerospace industry, what is being born in the, in, in the states now, uh, mostly in California and Florida, is the commercial space industry. In other words, after 2010, this space is open to the business public. So we expect that that industry, which today is about $20 billion a year, is, is growing at 10 to 15% per year. We expect that that $20 billion a year could easily reach 30 to $50 billion a year by 2020. So that, that's a very important um, area of opportunity. And again, that industry is extremely safety critical. Intellectual property is, 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 is very guarded. And that's why the European Union member countries and their stakeholders are top priority for partnership in the US. Then it's Canada and then it's Australia. So pay attention to that because business opportunities could materialize. This is a little bit of the different uh, 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 scientific and technologies that we are playing with. And uh, I'd like to just move, move quickly, but tell you that between now and 2025, we are in the birth stage of all these technologies. Same thing that in the IT world, Intel, Dell, Apple were in their birth stages 20 years ago. After that, 2025 to 2040, we expect to go into production, mass productions, the aircraft that you fly in as passengers will be powered by these technologies. But we have a 10-year window for small and medium-sized businesses and large businesses, like we have Iberdrola here, to take a look into positioning, into structuring, to take advantage of a revolution in the uh, energy, how the aerospace industry is powered. Um, 
in principle, as you can imagine, aerospace means vehicles that fly in space and in the atmosphere. 75% of the consumption in this industry comes from propulsion, from power plants, how the airplanes are moved, how the uh, vehicles are powered. But 25% comes in terms of the infrastructure around those aircraft. For instance, if you look at an airport, the energy consumption of aircraft uh, is, is being optimized as we speak. But if the airports are not optimizing their energy consumption, the economic gain from optimization on the vehicle doesn't match the economic gain or loss of the infrastructure. So 75-25 is the breakdown. And uh, here are a list of the technologies that we are looking at. For small airplanes, uh, the, the most promising technology is uh, electric. Uh, solar and fuel cell hybrids, like the plane I showed you that flew here in Spain with Boeing. When we come to air transportation, the, the probably 80% of the uh, innovation is coming from biofuels. Again, trying to get enough uh, biofuel production, still a little bit of fossil fuel there, but enough biofuel to avoid the volatility that the, the OPEC uh, cartel imposes on the industry. When we come to the space industry, here's where it gets very interesting. Um, what happens is that uh, in, the, in space, even though it's a low volume business, uh, what we find there, we translate into the uh, mainstream of, of regular uh, planet Earth and the surface. I'll, I'll give you an example. There are companies now that are developing a technology that enables them to print fuel. And, and we all know that fuels are produced in chemical processes, fuels are uh, mixed and derived, and, but consider the following. The efficiency of a fuel is based on the molecular organization of its atoms. Well, there are companies that are trying to organize those atoms by using a printer that takes the chemical components and prints out what we call perfect fuel. Fuel with atoms that are perfectly organized with efficiency gains in the double digits. What that means now is that with less fuel, we can do more. So imagine if the fuel you put in your car had been printed before and you needed 30% less fuel because now your fuel is perfectly efficient. There's no uh, granulation. So that's what's happening now uh, uh, in the space industry. That's a good example. We are playing with plasma, power plants, solar power plants. Consider the following, solar power stations. We are all used to solar uh, systems on Earth that the rays go through the atmosphere and produce power. What we are working with is how to put a solar power station in space to take the maximum power from the sun and then radiate via microwaves and directed energy its power to the Earth. We are doing that because we need that to go to asteroids, to go back to the moon, to go to Mars. But if we can power that energy down to Earth, there will be gains also on the ground. And that's why I tell a lot of investors both in Europe and the U.S., uh, to pay attention not only to the, the, the areas of aerospace that these new technologies affect, but the spin-offs that come down to the mainstream. And that's where the uh, business cases start being very interesting in terms of volumes. That's a little bit of a recap of what I talk about, and I know that everybody is thinking more about lunch than, than space and aerospace, and we need power as well, we need energy. Um, Few of the concepts that, that we are working with, uh, some are government, some are civilian, some are commercial, but if I can leave you with the thought that when you think about uh, the aerospace industry, in addition to air transportation, which is very obvious, and when we have a lot of that in Europe and uh, here in Spain and also in the Basque country, uh, start looking at this development, this birth of a new industry that could be uh, extremely interesting. So I'd like to leave you with some thoughts of how to and who should be engaged in these opportunities. And our firm, Interfly Global, is based in Miami. We have a presence in Madrid and in, in the Netherlands. And, and we, I'll be available to, to discuss with you how to take these opportunities in the U.S. or how to attract uh, U.S. stakeholders to your opportunities here in Europe. But one size doesn't fit all. We have to to look at uh, these segments that we discuss with a different angle. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll make cases in point. The space industry. The space industry right now is extremely low volume, 
extremely high margins. Whatever is commercialized out of the space industry is going to be a very high return on investment, and it has low cost sensitivity. In other words, it's not a commodity. It's, it's something you need, and you're willing to pay a little bit more for energy to launch a satellite, to keep a satellite in orbit, because the numbers we are talking about are in the hundreds or the thousands, but not in the millions like the automotive industry. So if you're a small or medium-sized European company, government and university, or a technology entity, you should take a serious look at the space industry. Um, general aviation, light aircraft, that's a medium volume, medium margin, somehow cost sensitive, and that applies to uh, medium-sized companies in Europe, like we have Senair, uh, um, some of the other engineering firms, some of them in the Basque country, extremely good companies, companies with revenues in the 1, 2 million euros up to 10 or 15 million euros a year. And then we come down to commercial aviation, which is air transportation. And that industry is searching for gains in energy uh, options. For instance, the gains come from two sides. One, the engines need to burn less fuel, need to burn cleaner fuel, but also better fuel, maybe printed fuel. But also the aircraft systems inside the airplane are going from using fuel from having the engines to work harder, they're moving into electrical systems. So everything you do now on a 787 or an Airbus 350 in the future, uh, before was powered by the engines, which was burning fuel. Now it's powered by small fuel cell batteries and it's powered electrically. So the engines burn less fuel, work less hard, and they save. This sector is extremely cost sensitive. In, in other words, whatever technology is applied to air transportation, even though it could be revolutionary, it has to cost very, very little. The margins air transportation has uh, are very low. So who is the European candidate to explore into opportunities that allow the Air Force to, for in the US, for instance, to be fossil fuel independent by 2020? It has to be big companies. We're talking about Iberdrola as a sponsor and, 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 and a local player. This is not for the small and medium-sized business. You need big companies that can be targets for a merger and acquisition or be an acquirer of a company or joint ventures and a strategic partnership because the volumes, even though they are not very high compared to the mainstream, they're very high in the aerospace industry. You have to enter that game with hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. So that's a little bit the, 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 the panorama in the uh, uh, aerospace industry. And now we have to add the word space to it. And uh, my experience with European companies from Germany, from the UK, from Spain, and from France, uh, and vice versa, American companies from different states looking at each other to how can we uh, improve, how can we innovate, how can we develop uh, the industry, again on Thursday, we'll talk about more aspects of this industry. Today we're talking about the energy side of it, but um, this dialogue, uh, if I can leave you with a thought, is, is, is ideal. This decade, as you can see through the media, there are some fractures in the uh, aerospace relationship of the US with some countries. Uh, for instance, in the space industry, the US and China are not cooperating for, for many political reasons. Uh, India is starting to shake. Russia has never been uh, a partner for security reasons and, and intellectual property reasons. The European Union has emerged, in our view, in the US, in different uh, government and private environments, as the ideal partner. We, are, we talk the same social, the same political maturity. We respect intellectual property. We have a legal system that allows a U.S. company and a European company to do business and respect their contracts, respect their values, respect their properties. So in my view, I've been about three decades in this business uh, in many different aspects. I've flown airplanes. I see how much fuel they burn. But this decade is very special, and I think uh, uh, the European Union is probably the U.S. favored partner for aerospace industry, for the emerging space industry, and uh, keep that in mind and uh, take the opportunities. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions. If you have uh, a couple of questions and want to wanna say something, I'll, I'll be happy to answer. Yeah, go ahead.
Oscar, there was one interesting point that you were talking about before as far as uh, energy generation from um, solar fields in space, right? And transmission via microwaves down to, down to the ground level as well as using it for a launch pad for long distance space flight. But I'm curious, I mean, do you envision that as actually being a practical application for generation? And if so, I mean, could that actually help us out with some of the storage issues that, that we're running into with renewables? Like, uh, uh, I mean, for instance, having the ability to relay that energy from the light side of the planet to the dark side of the planet in the off times could, you know, theoretically, if it's economically viable, work. I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question. The, the I'm not a technologist, so I, I cannot address the... I know there is an issue with uh, uh, signaling and storing the, the energy, and I know there is technologies being developed about that. But I, I can tell you about the process, the process of innovating in, in that arena, uh, whether or not we are going to use that energy to, to push a vehicle to another planet. Um, it must have some gains into how we do uh, other energy solar energy redirection on, on Earth. And I say that because if, if you follow a little bit the, the space and aerospace industry innovation chain from the Apollo days of the trips to the moon till today, I'll give you an example. What you use today in your car for a GPS, an, an embryonary version of that is what guided Apollo to the moon. So one could have said back then, what's the practicality of all these complex navigation systems that are taking two people to the moon and 19 people total. Who cares about 19 people? We are a few billion people on Earth. But, but that technology was the, the embryo that grew into GPS today that you use on your car, bicycle, airplane, whatever it is that, that, that you use for transportation. So what we see here is this type of technologies, at first, it might not make sense from a mainstream production. There are hurdles. Some of them don't evolve to where they were intended. We, the solar station in space might not do the job and might be taken aside. However, some of the spin-offs, some of the gains of that technology, always, uh, always a hard work, but almost always find a path down to consumer goods, engineering systems, transportation, uh, water purification, uh, other ways to use that light energy to do other things. And, and the space history is, is, is uh, peppered by a lot of those examples. So will it work, Matthew? I don't know. But certainly parts of it will be uh, used by the population at large. Any other questions or comments? I'd like to hear your views too, because when I go back to the U.S., I'd like to know what what are the um, the viewpoints, what are the, the 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 opportunities that you see from Europe uh, in this in this aspect. I know today is not the aerospace audience, but but if you have any questions, I'd like to to hear them. Okay. Well, I guess lunch is more important. Thank you very much.